Hello, Global Gardeners. It's great to have everybody here, whether you're watching or listening live or watching on replay. We have 90 minutes filled with gardening information. I'll be answering your questions. You'll be answering each other's questions, and I'll be throwing out a lot of good information with a focus today on seeds. All about seeds, sowing seeds, saving seeds, eating seeds, probably some things about seeds that you hadn't thought about before. And let's go ahead and start with a question that John Jude had asked just a little while ago before the stream started, asking about cantaloupe seeds. And do I need to do anything other than just save them and dry them and store them in a paper bag? And basically, that's all you need to do. Cantaloupe seeds, melon seeds, squash seeds are among the easiest to save. They start off in that gooey mass, and so you have to collect them from the fruit, but then spread them out on wax paper, newspaper, something to start the drying process. The seed will be moist, and it will stay relatively moist on the inside, but you want the outside to dry out. And many of those seeds, the melons, the squashes, will actually have kind of a papery outer shell. And so you can really try hard to wash off those seeds before you dry them, but that really isn't necessary because even if they've still got some of that gunk on the seed, once they start drying, that outer shell, that little layer, the protective layer around the seed will dry and flake off. And so after a week or two just out in the air drying, you'll be able to rub off all that gunk because all those little outer papery shells will just fall right off the seed. And then when you save the seed, <coughs> excuse me, you save it without having to worry too much about cleaning it because that all just falls off. And then you throw it in a paper bag or some other airtight container stored in a cool, dark location and you've got the seeds all ready for the next season. So it is that easy. You don't need to worry too much about it. We'll talk a little bit more as we progress today with some of the seeds that might be a little more difficult to save, but uh, pumpkin seeds, zucchini seeds, the, the watermelon seeds, all those big seeds are very similar and very easy to do. We already have Jean-Pierre from Belgium checking in and Yana from Saskatchewan, Canada, people all over the United States already. We've got Wisconsin and Nevada and Arizona and Georgia and Oregon. So keep checking in, keep saying your hellos because it's so great to see so many people returning every week. It's actually pretty cool and rainy here in Colorado. This is a Memorial Day weekend. It's a holiday here in the United States. Memorial Day in the United States is a day where we honor those who gave up their lives in support of our country. And I'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Unofficially, it's the beginning of summer. And so many of us are, are thinking about the holiday, thinking about the gardening, thinking about the summer. We shouldn't lose sight of all of the, the military members in our country's history for which this day is a holiday. And so I do want to highlight right at the beginning that this is Memorial Day, and we do need to think about those, those people that have been part of our history. But the focus of the show today, of course, will be on gardening, the beginning of the, the summer season, even though for some of us, we still can't get our tomatoes and peppers in the ground because it's still too cold. Our high temperature today is, is supposed to be just under 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 10 degrees Celsius. And that's the point where I start talking about the nighttime temperatures need to be that warm to put out the peppers and the squashes and the eggplants and the tomatoes. Well, right now, my daytime temperatures are only that high, which means the nights are much cooler. So I'm still, still waiting. It's supposed to warm up. Hopefully I'll be getting some of that in the ground at the end of the week. This, this whole week is crazy throughout the United States. The Western United States is just roasting 
in supremely high temperatures. It's just so hot. And there's many parts of the East Coast that are like me, where it's cold and drizzly. And then the middle of the country is all over the place. So I hope you're having a good holiday weekend here in the United States. And I hope that you're going to be able, like me, hopefully, to get out this next week and do some great gardening. Chris, great to see you here. Thank you so much for that contribution. Uh, found out the cucumber is a fruit and your mind is blown. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we refer to as vegetables in our garden that are actually fruits. One of the most famous is the tomato. And the reason I say that is famous is because I think, I think it was in the 1890s. It was actually a, a court battle that took place to define the, the terminology that we use in our gardens because tomatoes are a fruit. They have the, the, the pulp and the, the part that actually grows the actual tomato with the seeds on the inside, which is one of the definitions of a fruit, but it was being sold and marketed as a vegetable. So for tax reasons and the payments that the producers and the shippers and the distributors of tomatoes had to pay, there were different rules for the amount of money that they had to pay based on whether it was a fruit or a vegetable. And so it actually went through the courts. And while tomatoes are technically a fruit for legal reasons, at least 125 years ago, it was determined to be a vegetable garden. And so that's one of the reasons why we have vegetable gardens throughout the world. When in actuality, much of what we're growing in our vegetable gardens are fruits. Peppers are fruits. Squash is a fruit. All of those things that have the seeds on the inside, those are all fruits. A zucchini is a fruit. So we think of them as a vegetable, but technically they're a fruit. And that's why I, I can understand why there might be some confusion as I go through my answers in some of these live streams, is that I'll be referring to all of those things that you harvest as a fruit. The tomato fruit, the pepper fruit, the melon fruit, the squash fruit. But in actuality, if you're thinking of them as a vegetable, that's just fine because you do have some legal precedent behind it. So our moderators are all here today as well. We've got Jay and Heidi that have already checked in. Kiri has checked in, and so they'll be helping out as we proceed to give you answers to questions that I might not get to, and also just to keep everything running. So thank you to all of you who have already welcomed them because we do have a super set of moderators on this channel and just makes it so great. Ray55 Root says, yeah, that case was either New York or New Jersey. And you're right, I think it, I think it might've been New Jersey. And the courts ruled it was a veggie in favor of its taxable usage for human consumption. They ruled against science in favor of human use. So there you go. Also someone who knows that history. And it is, it's fascinating. There's so much about gardening that has a fascinating history. That's one of the reasons I like so much about it. And the tomatoes are just one part of it. Cal1699 says, rewatched your lilac pruning video. Lilac is kind of Memorial Day symbol for Discworld fans. So um, that's good. I'm glad you rewatched it. It's actually... Um, uh, and that, that was on May 25th, as you identified. Uh, yeah, my lilac video right now is actually my best performing video. I did it a couple years ago, but this is the time of year that gardeners are thinking about pruning their lilacs. And so if you have a lilac and you haven't seen that video, first, go ahead and see the video. But secondly, the key with most of the summer, the spring flowering shrubs and bushes, so a, a a spring flowering plant like lilacs, you should prune it just after it has finished blooming. And so a lot of people think you are supposed to prune everything in the winter because we prune trees in the winter. And if you prune your lilacs and other spring flowering plants in the winter, then you're wondering why you don't get any flowers in the spring. Well, it's because you pruned off all the buds and the flower buds begin to form right after the, the blooming. And so with lilacs, if you prune the, the plant back 
to a manageable size that you want right after it flowers, then the plant can set new flower buds for the following year at a point behind where you made that pruning cut. And I talked much more about that in the video. So uh, one of those to just add to your things to do this week if it's something that you are interested in and I'm not sure exactly how to do your lilacs. Okay, Linda saying, using cattle panels to trellis tomatoes. 12 tomatoes in. Good for you. Uh, I, I love my cattle panel trellises. And I've got the one arch trellis that I, I made a video about. I just set one of those up in my garden. And I covered it with plastic and put some tomatoes in. So even though it's really colder than I want to be for my tomatoes and peppers, my tomatoes inside are just getting so big because I was anticipating they would already be in the ground that I went ahead and put some in, put my cattle panel trellis over and covered it with plastic. And I know they'll do okay, but I'm planning to put a whole bunch more in later this week. So we'll see how that happens. Uh, let's see, Doris was wondering about um, protecting cucumbers and zucchini plants and already seeing dried and shriveled leaves. And so just like I, I just talked about putting plastic over the, the trellis hoop to try to hold in some extra heat for my tomatoes. Think along those same lines. If you have the squashes and the melons and all those other plants and you're in one of those areas, especially that's getting baked by the sun now or in the near future, start thinking about shade cloth. And I actually just put an order in uh, for a long roll of shade cloth. And that's what I do on a regular basis is I've got my hoops or I've got my cattle paddle trellises and I drape shade cloth over my plants. That can help because most of the time when you start seeing the dried leaves and the browning leaves, it does correlate to the, the severe heat. And so just a little bit of shade cloth can make a difference. Watering in the morning to kind of create a... a cool, humid environment as you water can get the plants started off well going into the day. That helps a little bit. But also take note of your watering. If you overwater or underwater, you're more likely to have dried leaves because the first thing that's going to happen is, at least in the lower leaves, the leaves closer to the roots, those are the leaves that the plant is going to sacrifice first. As plants are growing in our garden, most of the energy is going toward new growth. And so if your watering is out of whack, too little water or too much water, those lower leaves are the ones that the plant is essentially shutting down so that the plants, the roots energy can go into the new growth. So when you start seeing the lower leaves starting to shrivel and brown, it could be an indication that you're watering isn't matching the needs of the plant at that point. And so that's when you get in and you check the soil moisture to see if it's too wet or too dry, and then adjust your watering as needed. So drying leaves, think about throwing a little bit of shade out there if it's been hot, or adjusting your water if the weather is normal without too much issue. Uh, Sanel Dua says, I've been watching your videos for a few months now. Love them. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad that I can help out with that. And John Hafnicker, thanks so much for that contribution. Just a little help out a Colorado neighbor gardener. Well, I'm glad to uh, uh, hear that. And I hope that all this information can help you as a Colorado gardener, because this, as you well know, is a difficult region to do gardening. So any success you can have in Colorado is welcome. And I've gardened in California, in the San Joaquin Valley and it was so easy that it was no effort at all and you just expected success. And I gardened in Oklahoma with all the insects and the, the tornadoes and it was tough and it was so, so hard to actually find that success. And Colorado is similar. So when we actually have that gardening success in these tough regions, it just means so much more. I loved gardening in, in California, but I have to admit, it means more when I can get a tomato here in Colorado because I actually have to work for it. And Pat Patrick, good to see you as well. Thank you for that contribution. Can you pause hardening off? If so, do you start where you left over or start over? 
or left off or start over? Great question. And I've been going through this for two weeks now. I talked a little bit about it last week in the live stream because I was hardening off and then had to pause because we had the, the, the weather that just changed so dramatically and I brought the plants inside. I started them back outside this last week to harden off again and the weather changed and I brought them in. <clears throat> and so understand the basic concept behind hardening off. We're preparing the plants for conditions outside after they've been growing inside. And so you don't have to start over because if you have some plants that you're outside for three or four days and then the weather changes and you need to bring them back inside, well, they've already had three or four days to begin acclimatizing to your garden and your local weather. Now, when you put them back outside again, they might only need to be out for two or three or four days, and then you can put them in the ground. So typically hardening off is about a week long process. Well, if it gets delayed, you don't have to spend another week doing the whole process. It's, it's cumulative. And so the plants that were out for a couple days, then brought in and then put back out for a couple days, and then brought back in, well, that time uh, adds up and the plant is developing that ability to be outside and handle the sun and the wind and then the cool nights. So uh, I, I do add an extra day or two. So uh, like last week, my plants were out for three days. The week before they were out for about three days. So that's six days that these plants have been exposed to the outdoor conditions. Well, now I'll put them outside for probably two days and then I'll put them in the ground. And these are these are the peppers and some of the perennials that I'm just waiting for the soil to be warm enough. So they've essentially had almost a week of being outside and they've spent all day outside by this point. I just haven't left them out overnight because the nights are still just a little bit too chilly for me. And so once it warms up, which is supposed to happen in two or three days, then I'll leave them outside overnight just once or twice, and then I'll put them in the ground. So you don't have to start the clock over again. You can keep the clock running so that overall they've, been, they've reached the point where they can stay outside all day long and into the night, and then you can put them in the ground. So I hope that helps. Mama Preps 4 is wondering what zone I'm in. I'm in zone 5B, and as I've mentioned before as well, I think that our zone might change to a 6A when the USDA redoes the hardiness zone map sometime probably in the next 10 years. But uh, that's just a guess because this year we actually had zone 5B temperature. Zone 5B is defined by an average low temperature of minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit which is about minus 26 degrees Celsius. And we had that this year. We didn't have a day like that last year and we didn't have a day like that the year before, but it did get down that cold. And so even though the minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit defines a zone 5B, it's an average. And so over the last five to 10 years, just on my own uh, journaling, our average low temperature now is probably closer to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about minus 23 Celsius. And that's why I think that our zone will change. And so we'll see. I'm not aware that they're going to be updating the charts anytime soon. So I'm still officially a zone 5B. Um, Kiri says that I grew loofah a few years ago and, and she got some for Christmas. Um, so I didn't see your question, John, but uh, loofah is a gourd, and I had tried to grow loofah last year. I started the plants indoors, put them outside, and I don't know if it was a cutworm or a mouse, who knows, but all of those little gourd plants that I tried growing last year were eaten off right at the soil surface, and I wasn't able to get any gourds last year. So even, even those of us that have been doing it all, all these years, I'll have a year where everything grows well, like the loofahs that I did a few years ago, 
and then years like last year where not a single plant was able to grow because of some kind of pest in the garden. So thanks, Kiri, for jogging your and my memory. Lufa gourd, if you haven't grown leaf, lufa gourd, it's actually kind of fun to grow. And so lufa, the, the scrubber, the back scrubber that you use in the bath, that comes from a plant. It's a gourd. And so just like uh, I've, I've got videos on my birdhouse gourds where we make a, a birdhouse using birdhouse gourd, it's a type of plant and you just let it dry. Drying on the plant works better. Peel off the skin, wash it, and you now have the inside that has all those fibers, just like you would buy in some gift shop to scrub your back. You can grow those in your garden. And it does take a pretty long season. I'm, I'm thinking the loof is about a 120 day type of fruit. And so again, it's a fruit. The seeds are on the inside and it grows on a vine. And when you harvest it, you, you let it dry out, get the seeds out of it and become something you can scrub your back with. You can also eat it like a cucumber. It's actually in its younger stage before it develops all those fibers. It can it actually has a taste pretty similar to cucumbers. And so you can actually harvest the young loofah gourds and eat them in a salad if you want. So that's one of those kind of fun plants that many people aren't even aware of or don't even think about. And that might be something fun to try in your garden probably next year. Um, because it's probably a little late this year to have enough season to grow, but loofah gourds can actually be a lot of fun. Mage, Mage Gray Wolf is saying 120 days. Yeah, if that's what if you want to grow it, that may be um, something to check about if you can get your seeds and yeah, definitely get it planted soon. Um, Claudia says grow loofah and you will end up with hundreds of seeds. Absolutely, and the same with the birdhouse gourds and. Uh, all, all the others that when you dry out the, the the fruit to use it, you'll have hundreds of seeds. And if it's not, if it's not a hybrid, if it's an open pollinated plant, you'll never need to buy seeds again. And you can grow them year in and year out using the same seeds. So that's one of those. Since we're talking about seeds today, think about those kind of things, especially the unique plants. If you have trouble finding seeds for something, so like. For instance, if you go down to the local Walmart and they've got a whole row of the seeds, the flower seeds, the vegetable seeds, everything to grow in your garden, dollars to donuts, you're not going to find any loofah gourd seeds at Walmart. That's the kind of thing that you're going to need to uh, search for and maybe even order from an online nursery. But once you get those kind of unique plants, and you grow the fruit and you save the seed now you can just save the seed every year and just keep growing those plants year in and year out and you really don't need to save the seed every single year most of the plants that we're growing in our vegetable garden if we save the seeds you can expect the seeds to last for at least three years when i say last i mean remain viable and so when we talk about viability, when you buy a package of seeds, it should tell you on that seed package, at least in the United States, what the germination rate is going to be. And it should be, it's, it, it's expected to be more than 90% germination. So if you plant 10 seeds, you should expect at least nine of them to germinate and begin growing. Over time, that germination rate will decrease. And so the viability of the seed decreases as well. And so it reaches a point where especially the seed companies and many gardeners consider a seed not to be viable anymore because it might only be 50% of the seeds that you plant that will germinate. And so a lot of people think, well, that, that seed isn't viable anymore. Well. 50% of the seeds still is. And so when we talk about seeds like a carrot seed, for instance, because I have the carrot seed video, carrot seeds should be viable for about three years. So that means that if you save your carrot seed at the three-year point, most of those seeds will germinate. 
You shouldn't expect 100%, but you sh also shouldn't expect less than 50%. And so we say carrot seeds have a three-year viability because most of the seeds will germinate within that three-year period. But if you have carrot seeds that are five years old, you'll probably still have some carrot seeds that will germinate if you put them in the soil. It might only be 20 or 30 percent that will germinate, but there will probably still be some that that will start growing. And so officially you'll see charts that will list tomato seeds as being six or seven year as far as how long you can save them and still expect the plants to grow. But I've planted the tomato seeds that I've saved that have been 10 years old and still had about 90% germination rate. So a lot of it depends on how you store it. A lot of it depends on the actual variety that you're growing. But general guidelines are expect about three years for any seed that you grow. And beyond that point, if you do have the seeds, can, or if you do have the seeds germinate, consider yourself lucky. And so that's why getting back to the idea about saving the loofah gourds, you can save the loofah gourd seeds and about every two or three years, repeat that process of saving the seeds just to help yourself out with that viability concern so that when you do sow the seeds, you're more likely to have germination. But it, it, that's why I say some of my seeds are, I've got, you know, are are 10 year old tomato seeds because when I save the loofah gourd and I've got 300 loofah gourd seeds, I hate throwing away seeds. And so I'll save those seeds for years and then get to the point where they're just not germinating very well. You can toss those seeds in your compost pile. You can feed them to the birds and then start that process over again of saving the seeds. And it holds true for all the plants that you might be interested in and and saving the seeds. Jennifer says, seems like some seeds work in my zone, but not the dry climate in Utah. Any recommendation for what else to look for in plants that survive dry air and altitude? <clears throat> and so, uh, of course, whenever you're going to try a plant or try a new seed, read the description and and see if you can get the information from the website, from the catalog, from the expert at your nursery or from the seed packet. But you're exactly right. Often you'll see a plant or a seed packet that will say, like for perennial flowers, good in zone 5B. And that's what I'm looking for, zone 5 plants. Well, I hate to say this, but a lot of it comes down to experience where you grow a plant and realize it doesn't do well in your area. And now you know, even though it matches your zone, it doesn't match your dry Utah or my dry Colorado environment. You might be able to save some effort because those of us that have tried growing plants that just don't do well in the climate that we have in our region, you can go talk to another gardener who has experience in your area and they may have already tried plants and found out what works and what doesn't work. So for instance, my current bushes right now are doing great. And so I've got about eight current bushes that are growing in my backyard. Actually, six in my backyard, two in my front yard. And the currants are just incredible right now. Filled with flowers, I'm going to have a great crop of currants. But the gooseberries are struggling. Now, I know I can grow gooseberries only because it's me. I don't know any other gardeners in my area that are growing gooseberries. And I've actually talked to a couple who have tried growing gooseberries, but haven't had much luck. So I'm really trying hard to give my gooseberries what they want. Well, this is, this is what I'm talking about. If you can find a gardener who has experience in your particular area, find out what they have success with and what they don't. And I just recommended currants to one of the viewers who lives uh, pretty near to me as far as what fruits to grow. I said grow currants because I can say that in my area, currants grow very well, but I'm not going to recommend the honeyberries or the gooseberries yet until I find out exactly what I knew, need to do to 
get that success from those plants. And then once I do have that success, it now goes on to my list of recommendations. And, and so most of our local nurseries has somebody working there who has been gardening for a number of years. And those are the people I, I point you to. Go to your nursery, talk to that expert, and they should be able to help you out with the seeds and the plants to get you growing what should work well in your area. Taking into account things like the humidity, the temperature, and how long the, the season is. And that's Those are the, the factors, some of the factors you need to look at. Dwayne's checking in. Great to see you here, Dwayne. Joseph from Euless, Texas. Great to see you as well. And it's always nice to have people from all over spending your time on a Monday or watching on replay. It is really a good opportunity. Um, before we went on, Chris was wondering if I had a video about making a greenhouse. And I don't yet. I am planning to build a greenhouse at the end of this year. And so <clears throat> you can expect a video coming out. I've narrowed it down. I think I'm going to buy a kit. I had planned to actually build a greenhouse from scratch, but with the price of lumber right now, I can actually buy a kit that has metal construction. And that's about the same and maybe even potentially a little bit less than if I bought the lumber and built the greenhouse that I had planned. And the greenhouse I'm looking at, I um, uh, haven't fully decided yet, so I'll give you more information as we get closer to that. But it comes from a Canada company and it can withstand heavy winds and heavy snow. And those are some of my major concerns before I actually put a greenhouse in the ground. So if the lumber prices drop, then I may go ahead and stick with my original plan to build a wooden frame greenhouse. But if not, then I'll do the metal frame greenhouse. But either way, the soonest I'll have a video like that will be this fall. So a few months ahead of time. Veronica's wondering, any advice on growing corn in a container? Help from rainy Westminster, Colorado. <laughs> yeah, it's it's rainy all along the front range of Colorado today and cool. And so <clears throat> the thing about corn is it needs to be growing in a group of other corn plants. It's wind pollinated. And so you need to be growing a lot of corn close together. So you can grow corn in five gallon buckets. You can grow corn in grow bags. You just need to make sure that you have all of your containers close together. So if you have a container with maybe four or five corn plants in it, we'll have another container with four or five corn plants right next to it. And then another container right next to that. And if you can do a block, so depending on the size of your container, have three containers by three containers in a block of nine or four by four in a block of 16. That's what you're going to need to do to get your corn growing. Corn surprisingly can have pretty deep roots if you've got a nice rich soil. So the deeper the container, the better. And so a good well draining rich soil is, is fine. And you can grow corn in containers. Just make sure that you put them in a block so that they can pollinate each other and you'll actually get the ears of corn that you're looking for. Uh, let's see what else we have um, popping up. Be sure to keep those questions coming. Uh, Lauraful says, make a dirigible greenhouse. That's an interesting idea. Uh, there's, there's the thing about greenhouses in my area is, is I, I have so many people I know over the years that have, have tried different types of greenhouses and they get blown away or they get um, just absolutely destroyed by the, the heavy snows that we occasionally get. So I have to be very, be very careful about the greenhouses I choose. Yankee Sista, good to see you checking in again on a Monday. Hello to you. And I know you like to watch on replay. So there's a shout out to Yankee Sista. I'm so glad that you're here today. And thank you for that contribution. You be well as well as we move into this next week. And I hope we can see you again 
uh, next week as well. Vic Victor, hi Uncle Scott, hi everybody. Good to have you here as well. It's so nice, so nice. This is such a great community. I, I want to give a shout out to Mike Zuprina, who sent me a, an article uh, from Delaware. And so if you have something that you want to send me, uh, a photo, an article, anything along those lines, you can send it to Gardner Scott at gardnerscott.com. But Mike sent me this article that was written about a group of volunteers, of which Mike was one, who had gone out to a, a park in Delaware to remove some invasive weeds and to try to give the native plants a better opportunity to grow because they were being overwhelmed by some of these weedy plants. And so he and, and this other group were out there doing some great volunteer activity to really try to revitalize this park area and really encourage the native plants to grow, which I think is just a fantastic idea and, and it's a nice article. But, but one of the cool things uh, about it is Mike was wearing one of my t-shirts. So below this, this live stream and all my other videos, there are links to some of the Gardner Scott merchandise. One of the t-shirts I have, and I've worn it in a couple of videos, says, I kill plants so that others may thrive. And Mike was wearing that t-shirt. And so in this article, it actually shows Mike down pulling some of these weeds, wearing one of the Gardner Scott t-shirts. And that's actually what they titled the piece. So the, the reporter that wrote this article, that was the title that he put, I kill plants so others may thrive. So, and then he told the story about this group of volunteers that were pulling weeds to help the native plants thrive and grow better. So shout out to Mike. I'm not sure if you're here today or if you might watch this on replay, but I appreciate that article. And I appreciate you wearing a Gardner Scott shirt, especially since it was in an article that was read by people in Delaware. So I, I think that's incredible. That's that's one of those fun things to do. And so it, I, I haven't said this before, but because Mike sent that to me, if you have a, a photo of you wearing a Gardner Scott shirt, especially if it's tied to an article or any other experience, or if you're doing any type of volunteer activity and you've got a Gardner Scott shirt and you wanna take a picture, whatever that activity is, I, I encourage you to do so and send it to me at Gardner Scott at gardnerscott.com. And I, I was thinking about it. And if I get your photos and your permission, well, then I'll go ahead and find a place to try to include them in the live stream as part of the background or, or a slideshow that I'll put together. So I think that was just a great idea. And thank you, Mike, for prompting that idea. I think it could be a fun part of the show if we show some of that. If, if you want me to show you in a t-shirt, uh, by all means, tell me that. I, I won't share a photo of you unless you specifically tell me that I have your permission to use that photo. And that's one reason why I did not show the picture of Mike in my t-shirt, because the picture was taken for that article and I don't have the permission of the photographer or the author to use that photo, so I can't. But if I have your permission, I'll, I'll gladly throw those kind of photos out there. And so uh, shout out to Christy Wilson, because that's the background behind me today. This is Christy Wilson's garden from Kansas. And she sent this photo to me a few weeks back at the beginning of the Kansas season. She has about a 150 day growing season. And so this is a great photo at, that shows uh, a completely different way of gardening. So especially if you have a shorter growing season, and for me with about 134, 135 days, or Christy with 150 days, I've already told you that I've lost about two weeks from when I wanted to start growing until now, and I'm probably still another week away from actually putting some of my plants in the ground because the temperatures just aren't warm enough yet and it's primarily the soil temperature. So when you look at what Christy's doing <coughs> in her garden, you can see she's mulching with the black, and this is probably black weed fabric, but this is a great way to extend your growing season and actually get plants in the ground sooner. 
If you cover your soil with a black fabric or a black plastic, it's going to warm up faster. And so you're going to be able to put those plants that like a warm soil into the ground sooner. The air temperature, as long as it's above freezing, the plants are going to survive. It's, it's when the soil temperature is really cold that the plants become stunted. So if you can start the season by warming up your soil, by covering it with plastic landscape fabric or plastic, you're going to get a jump on your season. And so that's what I see behind me that Christy is doing, is warming up the soil to get that head start so that when she's ready to put the plants in the ground, it's all ready to go. Depending on the plant, uh, you are probably best suited to pull up the plastic. Now, landscape fabric, you do have some airflow and, and most of the landscape fabrics, water will go through it. You should put a mulch on top of the landscape fabric because that black plastic that or the black landscape fabric that's warming up the soil will continue to warm up the soil. So you actually put like a straw mulch or wood chip mulch or leaf or grass mulch on top of the black and that helps stop it from getting hotter and hotter and hotter. You can leave it in place that also cuts down on the weeds and so that is an option. The black plastic, I'm not a big fan of leaving that in place because that will cut down on the oxygen flow into the soil and also cut down if you're getting rain and you're watering, well, none of that's going to the soil because it's running off on the black plastic. But to start your season for a few weeks to warm up the soil, I think it's a great idea. And you can also see that she has some nice big cattle panel hoops to grow vertically. And so I'm a big fan of vertical gardening as well. And so this, I thought this was a really nice uh, demonstration of a couple different techniques. And even though uh, Christy says this is only her second year doing this garden, I can already see some great ideas at work. And I'm, I'm glad to share this photo. So uh, along the same lines I, where I'm just talking about the t-shirt, if you've got a photo of your garden space that you would like me to have as the background during these live streams, send it to me at Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com. Tell me a little story about it and I'll, I'll include it. I've got a few others that are in the queue right now. So we'll, we'll sh throw those up as uh, the time allows. And then we can talk about it and, and point out some of the good things that you're doing in your gardening. And Christy's doing some good things, so I'm glad I could throw it out there. Okay, let's see what else we have. Kay Russell says, I'm waiting for a straw bale as soon as it dries out, whenever that will be. And so I'm not sure if you're waiting to use it as mulch or waiting to grow in it, but if you're waiting to grow in it, um, keep it nice and moist. And that's what helps uh, condition it to the point that you can do some straw bale gardening. Uh, that's one of the videos I did uh, last year. Where I talked about my straw bale garden and showed you how to condition it. But if you're going to use it as a mulch, go ahead and you can spread it when it's still wet. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, use it as soon as you can be using it. <coughs> okay, let's see what Jay's saying to Connie Davids. And the seed package tag should have a maturity range four dates, about 100 days. And I'm not exactly sure which plant you're talking about, but let's go ahead and talk a little bit about um, that aspect when you're growing seeds and how it ties into your growing season and the maturity. And so when we grow our plants, and as uh, Jay just pointed out, the plant tag or the seed package should have days to maturity or days to harvest or some terminology similar to that. And so, like I was talking about the Lufa Gourd being a 120 day plant. Well, what that means is a little bit different than what you might expect. When we say that a plant is 100 days to harvest or 120 days to maturity, that is measured from when the plant is in the ground. And so for tomatoes, We'll grow tomato plants that might have an 80 or 85 days to maturity. That's the point that we can expect to harvest the fruit. Well, that's from when we transplant a tomato plant into the ground. And after that plant is growing, 
conditions are perfect, in about 85 days, we'll get a tomato. Peppers might be 100 days to harvest. And so it's after we put the plant in the ground, it's 100 days later that we'll be harvesting the cayenne peppers or whatever it happens to be. And so when we, when we bring this back to the discussion of seeds, that does not take into account the amount of time it takes for a seed to germinate and then for that seedling to grow. And so the pepper plants that I'm hoping to put out this week, I've been growing now for about three months. And so from the time that I started the seed until when that plant goes in the ground is about 12 weeks. So that's 85 days. So if I were to actually try to grow a pepper in my garden, it would be the 85 days that it takes for the seed to grow into a plant that's about six or seven inches tall. And then another 85 days or 90 days to get to the point where it's going to fruit. And so that's one of those things, especially for new gardeners, where you, you see a tag that says it's going to be 100 days to harvest and you start the seed. And then with a season like mine, that's only 135 days or a, a season like Christie's, that's only 150 days. Well, it might take 50 days for that plant to actually grow to the point that would start that 100 day clock. And so you have to be careful about that. And you do have to build that into your plan when you're growing from seed. And that's why so many of us are growing eggplants and peppers and tomatoes from seed indoors months ahead of time because the clock starts when that plant goes into the ground. Now, there are a number of seeds that grow very quickly. And so for cucumbers, for most melons, for pretty much all the squashes, I don't start them indoors ahead of time because they don't transplant well. So you really shouldn't be starting those seeds more than about three weeks early. But they grow so quickly that that extra three, three weeks I gain on the front side really doesn't make that much difference. By the time I start a cucumber seed three weeks early and then harden it off for about a week and then put it in the ground, well, if I just put a seed in the ground and start growing uh, as soon as the, the last frost date is over, it grows so quickly. And, and I've done side-by-side -side experiments with cucumbers and squashes that I'll start indoors and put them side-by-side -side with a seed that I start directly in the soil. And by the end of the season, you can't tell a difference between the plants. Uh, they just grow so quickly, you don't need that extra three weeks on the front side in most cases. And so a very, very short season, yes, that three weeks may make a difference. But for most of us, it, it's not going to make a difference. But do, do realize when the clock starts in that days to harvest or days to maturity, and it's when the plant is actively growing. And that may affect whether you start from seed or whether you start from a plant. Now, I, I, I start almost everything from seed, whether it's indoors and then transplanting or direct sowing outside. It saves me money. It allows me to, to, to grow specific plants that I want to grow. And those are the main reasons I do it. If you are wanting to grow a particular type of plant from seed, and then you understand when you read the seed packet where it talks about the days to harvest, and then often on seed packets, it will also say 14 days to germination. I, I saw this on um, some seeds I started recently. So you, it's gonna take two weeks before that seed even becomes a seedling. When you start doing the math and you actually start reading some of these seed packages that have a lot of good information on it, you'll realize, oh, wait, it's going to take two weeks for it to germinate. It's going to take 100 days before I get fruit. Gardner Scott just told me the, the clock doesn't even start until the plant has been growing for at least three weeks. Now you put all of that together and this 100 day plant is really 135 or 140. 40 day plant and that's if everything is perfect so i always add a buffer on top of that of at least another two weeks 
So now all of a sudden, the, the seed packet that tells you 100 days to maturity, when you add up all those numbers, it's actually 150 days to maturity. And so if you're like Christy in Kansas or me in Colorado, you're not going to have a harvest. And, and the LUFA gourds are one of those that falls into that category where when you put all the numbers together, I said it was probably 100, 120 days when I first started talking about the LUFA. That doesn't take into account the 30 days that it's going to take to start the seed, germinate the seed, and grow the plant for the clock to start. So a lot, a lot of gardeners don't talk about that. A lot of gardeners don't know about the math of seeds and how you have to put all of that together to actually reach the point of harvest. So if you've been trying to grow something and it never seems to get to the point that you can harvest it, that might be the reason right there. You just didn't add up that extra germination and growing time before the clock starts. Nicole says, I planted borage for the first time this year. I hope it reseeds like crazy. Me too. I actually grew borage from seed indoors. And this last week, I transplanted borage out into my pollinator garden. And I'm hoping it reseeds well too. Borage is a great plant. It's, it can handle some cold. It can handle some heat. It's edible if you want to eat it. It's got a wonderful flower that is great for attracting pollinators and beneficial insects. And so this is high on my list now of plants that all gardeners should be growing. Borage, B-O-R-A-G-E. And that's another one of those plants that, that too few gardeners are actually growing it. At least in the United States, we just don't know about this plant. And so I'm growing it for the purpose of attracting the insects in my garden. And occasionally I'll peel off a, a leaf and eat it, but a beautiful plant and, and it should reseed. And so I wish you luck. I hope you do get the reseeding as well as that continues to grow. So um, it's funny, I, I see some of the comments about Laurelful. And I did want to say Laurelful because I saw when you checked on today, um, it looks like Laurelful is swimming with the sharks today as a result of the autocorrect. And so Laurelful will know what I'm talking about in that respect, but I thought that was humorous. Okay, let's see what else we have. Yeah, Habiba says, I love borage. It's gorgeous too. It, it's so easy to grow. It, really, it, it can handle bad soil. It can handle terrible weather. And there's just so much about it that makes it a good plant to grow in your garden. So let's throw that out there for your homework. If you aren't currently growing borage, look into it a little bit and think about growing borage because uh, it, it can definitely add to your garden some of those things that you don't often think about. The, the insects and just the beauty of a plant that is so much different. It's got a big leaf and, and, and it's a beautiful color and really, really adds to the landscape. I'm I'm actually planning, assuming it reseeds, but I'll probably start more from seed next year anyway. Um, but I'm going to be putting it in my front landscape as a decorative plant, as something to make the scenery look uh, a little bit better. So something to think about. <clears throat> Drawing Momentum says, we have gnat season here on the western slope of Colorado. That's the other side of the Rocky Mountains. I wanted to share that organic clove oil helps repel them. Anyone have other suggestions? Um, I actually haven't used clove oil. Um, I think clove oil is one of those things that you, at least around here, you can only find at a pharmacist. And so I don't see it and I don't think about it. I've, I've read that clove oil works pretty well. I haven't actually done it. Um, but if it's a fungus gnat, cinnamon also works. Um, cinnamon has antifungal properties. I have a video coming up here soon where I'll be pointing out the yellow sticky traps. And that's actually one of the things I primarily use for gnats in the garden is I'll, I'll put up the, the yellow sticky traps and with a good spray of water to knock most of them off and then put the yellow sticky trap in that, that helps me at least keep my gnat population down. Uh, I, don't, I don't worry a lot about gnats. It depends on the gnat, of course. Fungus gnats can be a problem. But I've, I, have, I don't have a lot of luck because I live in a very dry region. But I know, and I've talked with gardeners like in the, the desert southwest of the United States, 
who have uh, lizards in their garden, for instance. And it's the lizards that take care of gnats. And so I'm hoping that I might be able to attract some toads to my garden. We, we don't normally have frogs and toads in this area, but I know they exist. So once I get everything growing and I've got ground covers and I've got mulches, I'm hoping I can attract some frogs and toads to my garden and I'll leave the gnats for them. There's, there's a lot of those kind of animals that actually feed on the small flies and the gnats. And so if, if you can build your garden up to that point where you can encourage that kind of wildlife, they'll take care of some of those flying insects as well. So something along those lines. Oh, there's Kiri. She says that she has clove oil. That's one of those things that um, for someone who has kids, clove oil is often used on the gums for sore teeth and things like that. Um, but I'll have to get with Kiri and talk about whether we should do some stuff in the garden with clove oil. Interesting. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have throwing on. Uh, yeah, not uh, drawing momentum says not really for my plants, but for my skin. They're eating me alive. I can definitely understand that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Melissa says fungus gnats seem to love when I use fish emulsion. And so anything that's going to keep the top of your soil wet and promote fungal growth and fish emulsion will definitely do that. It's going to attract a lot of those gnats. So that's something to definitely think about along those lines. If you just allow the, the surface of the soil to dry out often, just a day is all you need to to kill the fungus that's on the top and that'll basically lead to the demise of the fungus gnats as well. So um, put that in your bag of tricks as you start thinking about some of the other things you want to do. Uh, I, I did want to uh, also talk about the general idea of saving seeds and we've talked a little bit about it uh, already today. But as you think about the plants you're going to be growing and I've said this before, but I, I want to reiterate it. Think in terms of saving the seeds and grow a plant for the purpose of saving your seeds. And so I, I sowed some carrot seeds this last week, black nebula carrots, which is a really deep purple carrot. And it's in my purple garden bed that my granddaughters are going to help me with. And I want to save some of that black nebula carrot seed. And so I intentionally sowed those carrot seeds on the end of that garden bed so that it really doesn't disrupt the other plants. Why? Because anticipating that I want to save the black nebula carrot seeds, carrots are a biennial plant. So I have to leave those plants in the ground over the winter to collect the seeds next year. It's, it holds true with pretty much all the root crops. If you're growing rutabagas or turnips or beetroot, if you wanna save those seeds, you have to think about it as a two-year process. You grow them this year, you leave them in the ground over the winter, and then you collect the seeds next year. And so that requires planning, and it requires planning as far as where you're going to sow those seeds. So that's why I started those seeds in the very end of the bed so that this season, as I harvest the other plants in that bed, so I've got kohlrabi in that bed, I've got potatoes in that bed, I've got beans in that bed, all those plants are going to be harvested and most of them are going to be pulled before the end of the season and new seeds and new plants are going to be put in. The whole time, the carrots that have their own little designated spot at the end of the bed are going to stay undisturbed to grow. I'll harvest some of them this year, but I'll leave some in the ground at the very end of the bed for next year. So think about those kind of things when you want to save your seed. Learn about the plant and what it requires for you to save the seed. Cilantro, I've got a, a video on how, on saving cilantro seed. Well, if you're growing cilantro to, to use the, the, the leaves in a salsa or for cooking, the plant grows pretty quickly. And you can start harvesting those leaves usually within a month easily. And by harvesting the outer leaves, the plant can continue to grow and you can keep a harvest going for a long time. 
when it bolts and sends up the flower stock and then sets seeds, it's going to take a couple months for those seeds to actually mature to the point where you can harvest the cilantro seeds or use those seeds in cooking as well. And so if, you, if you're growing the cilantro as an example now, and then halfway through the season, you think, oh, I think I'll let the cilantro go to seed, save the seed. You have to allow that extra time that may not been a part of your original plan. Now I'm guilty of this all the time where I'm planning on doing succession planting, where I'll grow the plants when they bolt, I'll pull them up and put them in the compost and then grow something else. And then halfway through, I change my mind and decide I will let some of those plants continue to grow and save the seed. I did that this last year with turnips. I was going to harvest all the turnips and then they just looked so great and I wanted to get some footage on turnip seeds. I went ahead and allowed the turnips to continue growing, set seed, and then I saved the turnip seeds. Well, that totally disrupted my plan for that garden bed. So I didn't grow some of the cucumbers or squashes that I had originally planned for that bed because halfway through I changed my mind and decided to let the turnips go to seed. You can build that into your plan. You can plan for saving seeds well ahead of time if you're on the ball. That way you can place the plants, like I mentioned with the carrots, so that they don't interfere with the rest of your gardening plan and the rest of your growing and harvest plan. So, so by all means, save seed at every opportunity, but you'll get more out of your garden, more harvest and more seeds if you actually plan for where the seeds are going to be coming from with that plant. <clears throat> Gretchen M, thank you so much for that super chat contribution. Hi, Garner Scott. I'm having issues with aphids attacking mostly my delicate herbs. Cilantro, basil, what do you recommend? Thanks. <clears throat> and so one of the best things to deal with aphids is water. A strong spray of water will blow off the aphids from most plants. Now, when you're growing something like the, the basil or the cilantro, where you're planning on eating the leaves, well, neem oil, which is often recommended for aphids, is not something I recommend. Neem oil, you can eat it, but it tastes terrible. And so I wouldn't use neem oil on herbs like that because it will affect the flavor. The same with a lot of the other home remedies that you may have seen that you can make a, a, a spray of uh, peppers or whatever and put it on the plant and it's going to affect the flavor. And so aphids are best handled with just a spray of water or get down there and shake the plant. You can actually shake those aphids onto the ground and when they fall on the ground, in most cases it's going to break their legs or break their body and they're not going to be able to come back on. But, but the thing that I do more long term, and it might not be too late for you, but start growing a lot of other plants, a lot of other variety. Allow weeds to grow, allow grasses to grow because that's going to attract the ladybugs and the lacewings. And the there's a, a, a wasp, believe it or not, there's a wasp that is almost too small to see. And the primary food for that wasp and the, the wasp larva are aphids. So this, this wasp is so small, it actually injects its stinger into the aphid. And there's all kinds of insects like that. Well, they're attracted by a lot of herbs, a lot of flowers, a lot of other, other plants. So increase the diversity in your garden, and that will attract a lot of these beneficial insects. And those beneficial insects will take care of a problem like aphids. I don't try to get rid of all my aphids because when the ladybugs show up, they need something to eat. And so there needs to be some aphids on my plants so that the ladybugs stay. And that's, that's a big reason why I'm not an advocate of herbicides and just blanketing a garden bed with herbicides. Because if you kill all of those pests, now when the good insects show up, they've got no food. 
And so they're going to go to another garden. And then the bad insects are going to reappear and there aren't going to be any natural uh, insects to deal with them, which means you need to use more herbicides. So if you can get that cycle of life going where the ladybugs have a presence in your garden along with those other beneficials, they usually come a few weeks after the aphids. So you do have to accept that you'll have a week or two with aphids eating some of your plants, but then the ladybugs will show up and hopefully remain through the season. And the, the turnips last year, the turnips were a huge magnet plant for ladybugs. I had, I had ladybugs just covering my turnip plants. And part of that was because I had some aphids that also went to my turnip plants. Well, turnips are a great magnet plant for attracting not only the aphids, but also the beneficial insects. So think about growing some of those plants. Grow, grow some turnips around your cilantro or grow the cilantro around your turnips. And that's one of those companion planting ideas where the turnip is actually the one that the, the aphids are eating and they're not eating your, your cilantro or any of your other plants. And it doesn't matter if aphids eat your turnip because you're, you're growing the turnip plant primarily for the root and those aphids aren't going to be eating the root. They, they'll eat the leaves, but the turnip can still grow pretty well even after having some of the leaves being eaten by the aphids. So diversity in your planting, attract those beneficials, and especially with those leaves that are edible, that's a good way to stay away from having to put something like neem oil or or another um, spray that you wouldn't like the taste of. Okay, let's see. Uh, Jay Dixon is talking about simplified gardening. Tony has some great success in using nursery pots for potatoes, and he is a good buddy of mine. So um, I've, I've just done the one potato video that I did a few weeks back. Tony on simplified gardening has got a number of videos on potatoes, and he really has some good advice. So yes, if you're wondering about potatoes, that's a great way to learn more. And he does pretty most of his growing in the containers, which is great. Um, Laura Fool says, if animals eat your food, does that mean you have to eat those animals? It doesn't mean you have to. In your case, I think you probably should. And then you can get back to us with the taste of the animal. And I would suggest that you do a side-by-side -side comparison. So if you know a particular animal is eating your plants, Laurelful, then go ahead and eat that same animal from a different area that wasn't using your plants for food and see if you can tell a difference in the, the meat of that animal. Just, just saying, just wondering. Uh, I think I was attacked by chickens this week. I have a number of beds with new seeds in them and some fresh mulch on top. And I went out a few days ago and a lot of the beds had been clearly disturbed. And based on previous disturbing, it looks a lot like chickens. And so my neighbor has chickens and occasionally one chicken in particular, in particular will jump the fence and I think that happened a couple days ago. So in this particular case, I would be interested in eating the animal that was eating my plants. So depends on the animal, of course, but in the case of a chicken, it might be worth it. Just saying. Okay, Chris says, um, I've been stung by the macroscope wasp and it's worse than yellow jackets. Uh, the, I'm a big fan of wasps in the garden because they can do some incredible things dealing with those pests, but that can be one of the downfalls. Um, I, I did that, it actually was a nest of yellow jackets, but I had a pile of mulch, some grass and straw, and I most often wear my gloves, but in this particular day, it's like, oh, I'm gonna grab the, some of this mulch, and I just stuck my hands into that pile to spread that mulch, and there was a yellow jacket nest in that pile. So uh, it was annoying, it hurt, it reminded me that's one of the reasons why I wear gloves anytime I'm mulching my garden, but I feel your pain, buddy, because it can be literally a pain with some of those wasps in the garden. For the most part, if you leave the insects alone, if you understand where they're nesting and how they're nesting, and just let them do their job in the garden 
you won't have as many issues. But if you're a gardener, you've more than likely been stung by a wasp. And if you haven't been stung by a wasp, your time is coming. Gretchen says, thanks. I'm working on diversity in the garden, getting it established. And we'll try some turnips. I'm also going to plant some micro clover. Good idea. Took out the grass. Good idea. On the other side of the yard. <coughs> now, there's, there's nothing wrong with grass. And when I refer to grass, I'm usually talking about clumping grasses, like native grasses for whatever your area happens to be. I, and there's nothing wrong with growing grass. In fact, if, if my soil were better and my conditions were better, I'd probably be growing grass on my pathways. It's it's if you have a wide expanse of grass and that's all that's growing is a turf grass. It really isn't adding a lot to your garden from that perspective of biodiversity. And so, yeah, having some clover and other options, I think that's a great idea. So glad to hear that you're doing that. L. Johnson says, great story. Our chickens are great for the compost pile area, but terrible if they get in the garden, those feet of theirs. Yeah. And these these chickens are, um, I think he's got six, six or seven chickens. And actually a couple of chickens came from Kiri. She donated some chickens to my neighbor. And they they like to dig down and and get that that dust in their feathers. And so not only do they dig and eat the plants, but they also create some big holes as they're fluffing up their feathers in the bed. So chickens can be great for the garden in many areas, except for smack dab in the middle of your bed. So something to think about. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have popping up. Elisa Taylor says, I have bumblebees and I have honeysuckle growing behind my garden for the bees and hummingbirds. Good for you. Um, I've got some honeysuckle that uh, just put in the ground a, a month or so ago. No flowers yet, I'm looking forward to. I've got some cardinal flowers that I grew from seed. I've got so many flowers coming. You'll see it all in videos to come over the next couple of months when I actually start getting some of these flowers to bloom. But it's diversity, just keep growing more and more and more. Uh, I put some, some daisy plants in the ground this week that I started from seed. I did some um, Black Eyed Susan plants that I grew from seed, some uh, Monarda, some bee balm that I grew from seed. So I've been putting in dozens of perennials into my garden. They're still really small because I just started them from seed. I probably won't get flowers until next year. And that also is one of those things you have to plan ahead for. If you're going to start perennials from seed, it's going to be a couple years before you get flowers. So go ahead and buy a plant if you want to get the impact right away. But just like the seeds, you've got to plan ahead of time. Many of these I'm looking forward to reseeding. And so back to the topic of the day about seeds. I, I try to group the plants as much as possible. And I let most of the flowers go to seed. And so last year I grew California poppy in my front yard. I love California poppy, beautiful orange flower. And I let it go to seed. Well, the last couple of weeks, I've noticed I've got dozens of California poppy plants that are starting to appear. And I love it because I was only growing them in a very small area outside my front door. And now they've spread into an area five or six times that much, which is exactly what I wanted. And so think about that aspect as well. When you are growing flowers for the purpose of reseeding, like we were talking about borage earlier, Put the plant that is the mother plant that's going to be producing all of these seeds. Put it in an area that's that's in the middle of the area that you want populated with the expectation that as those seeds fall and then sprout in the following year, it will be a larger area circular from that central point. And that's one of those ways you can plan a future garden. And so when I look at my space in, in the front yard in particular, I'll have a plant, then four feet away I'll have another plant, then four feet away I'll have another plant. Well, I'm anticipating years from now, each of those plants will spread out as they flower and drop seed. And so that whole area, I'm not going to have individual perennial plants that are four feet apart. I'm going to have an entire area that's blanketed 
by those particular flowers that are acting as the mother from the very beginning. And it'll be the future generations that spread that plant. So when you when you think about seeds, it's not just you buying the seed packet this year and planting. It may be your intentional plan for using the seeds that will naturally drop and grow in the future. And you don't have to worry about things like cold stratification. Some of these perennials that I grew this year required a lot of work. I had to put the seeds in a plastic bag with a wet paper towel in the refrigerator for two months and then bring them out and then allow the seeds to germinate and grow. Well, once you get those kind of perennial plants that may be difficult to grow from seed, once they're in your garden, now those flower seeds are going to drop and then naturally be exposed to the cold winter conditions that the seeds need before they germinate and grow in the springtime. So maybe a lot of work up front, but it can pay great dividends later on. And like my California poppies, um, I'm really looking forward to a blanket of orange flowers. And I'll be doing that with a lot of others in the years to come, a lot of other flowers as well. Phil says, my bed of onion sets are struggling, not dead yet, but aren't big and healthy. Weather's been up and down, was about to pull them, but now see new leaf curls. Pull them now or wait. I would wait. I like to give plants a chance, and especially if you're seeing new growth. When you get onion sets, depending on where you get them from, they're pretty stressed, and they're probably pretty high, dehydrated, and it's going to take a while for that plant to rebound and start growing again. And it, it may take longer than you're expecting. But, when, but as soon as you start seeing that new growth, that's telling you that the plant made it. It's, it's overcome that adversity and it's starting to grow. The up and down weather is a factor and the plants may not fully recover to the point. If there are other things that you want to grow and that space is, is prime real estate, then sure, go ahead and pull some of the onions up and put other plants in that will do better in your current weather. But I always like to at least give some of the plants a chance, uh, especially the ones that are showing growth and that might surprise you. They might bounce back pretty quickly. So um, I would say a balance. If you, if you don't need the space, let them keep growing. But if you have other plants to grow, go ahead and pull some, put in the other plants and allow some of the onions to continue just so you can see what they look like at the different stages based on starting from uh, onions and that in, 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 with a set of onions rather than like onion seed. And, and I, I have that in my notes as well. I wanted to talk about um, as you're thinking about what seeds to grow, uh, this is another one of those things to talk to other gardeners about and hopefully develop your gardening network because I had started onions from starts, from the, the little sets that you buy, the, you know, 10 onions with a rubber band and they look terrible and they're all dried out and you put them in. And then one year at the Galileo Garden, the school garden, we had a whole bunch of onions and I decided, like I said, halfway through the season, let's let these onions go to seed. And onions are biennial, so you have to wait until the following year for the flower to appear and those seeds to set. And they did great. And it was a school. The kids were involved. I waited for the students to come out and help with the harvesting of the seeds. But getting the students out on the plant schedule didn't always match, which meant the onions flowered and many of them set seed and many of those seeds dropped before we can harvest them. The following year, we had thousands of onions growing in the pathways in beds that were growing onions and beds next to the beds that were growing onions. And so that was a real wake up call of just how easy it is to grow onions from seed because I did nothing. I just let the onions naturally set seed and then let those seeds fall, did nothing to those beds all winter long. And then the seeds popped up in the spring as soon as the conditions were right. So there are a lot of seeds like that, that you have the opportunity to grow in your garden that you may think are difficult to grow or because you see the onion sets growing or being sold in a nursery, you think that's the best way to do it. And I suggest talking to other gardeners, 
listening to stories and finding out that some of these plants that were not growing from seed are extremely easy to grow from seed. Like I mentioned earlier, the melons and the cucumbers and the squashes are so easy to grow from seed that you don't need to spend money to buy a plant at a big box store just to get an extra couple weeks advance. They just grow so well from seed and grow so quickly that you can save yourself some money. And then at the end of the season, if it's a open pollinated plant, you save the seed and do it all over again the following year. Let's see, Tamara says, going to plant the poppies along our front road. Good smiley face, that's a great idea. <coughs> Gotta have poppies since we live in California. Glad to know that they still might germinate, at least have two that germinated. That's good. I also have some of the big poppies, some of the Chinese poppies that, that I put in last year, and the plants are doing great. Another one of those that I grew from seed last year, didn't flower last year. This year it's coming back, and I fully expect the big poppies to really uh, do well this year. And I'll do the same thing. I'll let those seeds fall and we'll see what happens if they germinate i'll have an increasing number of the big beautiful poppies growing next year so it, it's an ongoing process and, and it's how you want to do it but it is something to think about and then also as you're growing these plants to turn into seed kind of like i was talking about with cilantro that becomes coriander if you allow it to set seed and then you save those seeds there are a number of, of plants that you can grow for one purpose and you save the seed and you can actually eat the seed as an, a, uh, a harvest that you are intentionally doing. Dill is another perfect example of this. I grow dill in my garden to collect the leaves and I'll dry the leaves and I use a lot of dill leaves on fish when I grill up fish or have a fish dish. Um, I also use the dill and dill pickles, and I'll use the dill when I make tartar sauce. Those are the leaves, but you can save the dill seed and do the same thing. Use dill seed in your cooking to add a, another great flavor to it. Uh, I, I just shared a chive plant with Kiri, and we were talking about that as well. Chives uh, and onions. In, in general, uh, all, of, all of those plants that we're eating primarily, like the onions for the bulb, but you can eat the greens of the onion. Well, the chives were growing primarily to eat the greens. Well, if you let onions and chives grow and uh, reach the point where they flower, you can eat the flowers. The flowers are actually delicious. And I actually shared some of the flowers with Kiri, who was quite surprised at how good it tasted and with the grandkids as well. Uh, but the seeds, you can save a lot of those seeds and they will have that same general flavor. And so chive flowers taste a lot like chives and chive seeds, you can actually sprinkle on some of your dishes and it'll give you a little bit of a crunchy chive flavor to it. And so experiment with some of that. If the plant you're growing is completely edible, then chances are the seed is also going to be edible. And we, we do it with pumpkin seeds. You save your pumpkin seeds, you roast them, and then you eat the pumpkin seeds. Well, most of the other seeds you're growing in your garden are the same thing. They're edible. And if you try them, you might actually like the flavor of the seed. Peas, well, peas are nothing more than the seed of the pea plant. And we eat peas. Beans are the seed of a bean plant and we eat the beans. So expand your, your seed library when it comes to cooking and eating because there are so many seeds that we are intentionally growing to eat and there are probably a lot of seeds that you never even thought about eating that you can. And it's really kind of fun, especially with the kids. If you find out that there's a particular kind of seed that you like, well, then you share that seed with your kids and that's one of those things that that might turn them on to the idea of gardening as well. So just something to think about. Just something to think about. Jean-Pierre, merci. Um, not only a great gardener, but also a great cook. I, I, I do like cooking, and, and I, I am a pretty good cook, if I don't say so myself. I think my daughter would agree with that. 
And a lot of it is just because I'm a gardener and I'm growing some of what I cook. And I love few things more than harvesting something fresh and using it in the kitchen. And so, yes, if you, if you are a gardener, I think it's a great way to become a better cook if you start thinking about doing some of these things, like with seeds and all the other plants that we're growing. Uh, just use them in your kitchen in innovative ways, and that's a great way to become not only a better gardener, but to become a better cook as well. So uh, there you have that part of it. I do want to talk about, as I mentioned at the very beginning, because this is Memorial Day, and I do want to, to say again that, that we should not lose sight of that. As most of you know, I was a career Air Force officer. I retired almost 20 years ago now after a full career in the Air Force. And I, there, there are people that, that I served with who died in the line of duty. And so for me, it, it does have some personal notes. Uh, I, I have, have seen literally people that I flew with and served with die in the line of duty. And I, I don't, don't want to be this a down, be this be a downer by any stretch, but I do want to bring back to you, especially in the United States, the concept of what Memorial Day is and that it is a day where we choose to honor the dead who have given up their lives for our country. I would ask you, as we finish today's presentation, to take this a step further in your garden and use your garden as an opportunity to memorialize somebody in your life that you want to remember. And so a, a number of years ago, my wife and I planted a tree in our front yard in memory of her father and her father had served in the Air Force and she had his ashes and as we planted this tree we made that area of the garden a memorial for her father and it had a direct link because his ashes were buried in the soil for this tree that we were growing to honor his memory. And you can do this not just for military members, and, and I encourage you to expand it to anyone that you want to remember in your garden. I think gardening is a great way to form new memories, but also to prompt those memories from years past that are too often forgotten. And so set up some garden space, set some areas with specific plants that you're growing for specific reasons. And so Sweet William is a flower, a low flower that I like to grow in my garden because it was my, the favorite flower of my grandmother. And so when I grow Sweet William in my garden, every time I see it in bloom, it makes me think of my grandmother. It, it, it's a reminder. It's one of those things that just makes gardening just that extra little bit special. We talk about growing vegetables, we talk about seeds, we get focused a lot on the food aspect of our gardening. But I think just the overall emotional reason that we're gardening and the emotional benefits of gardening is something we don't often talk about. Now, I talk about it because I think it's important. And I do this on a regular basis, talking about these kind of aspects when it comes to gardening. But if you're right now focused primarily on the vegetables and what you're going to be eating in your garden, well, expand your world a little bit and start thinking about somebody in your life, someone that you would like to remember, someone to memorialize in your garden with a tree, with a shrub, with a flower, or even with a food. If, if somebody you want to remember their favorite food was the golden beet, well then grow golden beets as a way to remember those people and do that year in and year out. I like to do it with perennial plants because they come back and just the idea that they're coming back every year helps with that memory, that that a person you're trying to remember is always there every year. They're coming back 
too in your memories. And so on this Memorial Day, by all means, understand the, the purpose of the day to remember the important people in the history of our country, but also use it as maybe an opportunity for you to begin remembering other people that you have a reason to remember and use your garden to help that, especially for future generations. So you can point out to your kids and your grandkids as for years and years to come that this tree or this flower or this particular part of the garden is set aside in remembrance of somebody special. So I wanted to, to just bring that up today for you because this is a day of remembrance and it makes me think about some of those things I've done in my garden in, in years past, in past gardens, but also as I continue to build my garden and create new areas, I'm always looking for a reason to grow a plant and a reason to create a new bed and a reason to, to plan the expansion of my garden. And often this is a reason. It's that, that remembrance that now becomes a reason for picking the plants and building the bed and just making your garden space even that much more enjoyable. So something to think about on this important day. I hope my weather improves as the week progresses. I hope your weather improves as the week progresses. And I hope that you'll be back with us again next Monday, either live or in the replay, so we can talk more about gardening, get your questions answered, and just be a nice community that we can share some time with. I'm looking forward to a great gardening week. I have no doubt you are too. And I'll be sharing it next week, same time, same place on Monday. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening. See you next time.